Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this conference on France and the Western Balkans EU membership, organized by the Belgrade Center for Security Policies. I am Marion Dautry. I work as a fact-checking journalist for the French press agency in Belgrade. Uh, and prior to that, I was a foreign correspondent for the Western Balkan region, and I will be moderating today uh, the two panels. So we will start with a few words of introduction uh, by Igor Bandovich from the Belgrade Center for Security Policies and uh, by the ambassador of France to Serbia, Jean-Louis Falconi. Our first panel will be focusing on the French point of view on the uh, EU enlargement to the Western Balkan. We will have with us Sergeant Speech, senior policy analyst with the Open Society uh, European Policy Institute in Brussels, Loïc Trégouret, um, Balkan specialist, and Sébastien Grico, who is uh, the director of the Balkan Observatory for the Jean Jaurès Foundation. And our second panel will look at the other side of the story, which is the regional point of view on, the, um, on France and the EU enlargement, and whether France can become an ally on the European path. And we will have with us uh, Alba Cella, who is executive director and head of the European program at the Albanian Institute for International Studies in Tirana. Uh, Jovan Amarovic, who is executive director at uh, Politicon Network in Montenegro. Zora Neshev, who is the head of the Center for EU Integration of the Institute for Democracy, Societas Civilis in Skopje. And finally, Vuk Vuksanovic from uh, the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. Um, there will be time after the discussion for Q&A, so if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the, uh, in the chat. And with further ado, please, Igor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marian. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really uh, grateful that we managed to organize this event, and I'm honored to have such a distinguished experts who will be talking on the French role in the Western Balkans, but also vice versa on the what is the uh, what Western Balkans thinks about French role uh, here. Uh, we are organizing this event uh, because I think it's very timely to have discussion on on France and the Western Balkans. A lot of things have been happening lately in this regard, and certainly one of the really, really important initiative, uh, which was launched by the uh, France uh, with regard to the uh, new revised methodology of the accession process is something which probably our experts will look into uh, during these two panels. I'm really, really grateful that we have um, French ambassador to Serbia, Jean-Louis Falconi, who uh, decided to join us here. And uh, I think that this event will be not one shot event and that we will have um, regular and continuous discussions on these topics, especially um, as uh, France has demonstrated that uh, there is a, a great interest and potential in her role in, in the Balkans. Without further ado, I will give a uh, floor to Mr. Ambassador. Okay, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your invitation. I have to say, uh, uh, first of all, I saw the very nice presentation of the of the document France and the Western Balkans EU membership with a bleu blanc rouge flag, uh, and then I received an invitation to 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 see if I wanted to participate. And I have to tell you frankly that, uh, of course, I felt a little bit concerned. <laughs> Uh, so I said that at least uh, if someone has to talk about, let's say, the official position of France, uh, we had to do that. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, but then I have to say something. Uh, I'm the French ambassador to Serbia, so uh, the topic is more general. So let's say that, and, and knowing that already uh, I may have, let's say, a Serbian context bias, which uh, to start with in this region uh, is uh, certainly terrible in terms of neutrality, but that's the fact. Huh? So um, I just wanted to say that uh, I wanted to share some, some comments about, first of all, the present position of France, but also my past experience as, let's say, EU specialist from 1991 to 2013. For 22 years, I've only dealt with EU matters, and particularly I dealt 
I was in charge of the question of enlargement in Paris during uh, the 2002-2004 enlargement. Uh, and then, so my experience here, a little bit in the region, but uh, taking into account the context of the region, but also the, the, the perhaps the particular situation of Serbia, because this is the one I know best. Uh, so what do I have to say about the initial question? Uh, France and the Western Balkan EU membership, what is our position? You will not be surprised that, uh, I mean, the French position is to be determined to have the Balkan countries in the EU. This is a promise that started first, I have to repeat it, during the Zagreb summit, which was not then part of the EU, but under the French presidency of 2000. We then had the Thessaloniki summit that I used to prepare in my position in Paris, where this promise was reiterated. And so far, I, you just have to listen to the President Macron's speech uh, during the uh, Sofia summit for the Berlin process on the 10th of November 2020, who clearly repeated that we need to keep this commitment, the Balkan part uh, belong to EU geographically, historically, cultural, culturally, and uh, allow me to reassert very clearly that France su su supports the European perspective of the Western Balkans. So, and let me just add you that to make it more credible, it's not just, uh, let's say, diplomatic good promises or kind words, because, and I have know this because I've, I've experienced it in Brussels, this promise has not been made to any other region or country in the world. So French vision is that we need to keep a balance between enlargement and the cohesion of the EU. And this balance is kept with the Balkans inside the EU. So I'm sorry to say that perhaps it's not very fair to other countries outside this area, but France has been fighting very hard not to make this promise on EU level to other regions. So we have the Eastern Partnership. It's a very valid partnership. It's a very important region. Everything, by the way, when you have a group of countries, everything that concerns the surrounding is very important to you. But then comes the question of where do you have to stop? And from this point of view, France position has always been very consistent that this promise, although they are enormous discussions inside the EU has not been made to any other country outside the EU plus the Balkans. So in a way, I would say that perhaps I know that this position is questioned. So this is why I insist on that. But I'd like to say that this promise has been done and we intend to fulfill it. And it's not only just kind word, but it's a sincere promise. And we have not made this promise to honor any other region. That's one thing as far as France is concerned. Uh, then, of course, what does it mean? It means that we have to work on both sides. So I have to say something, perhaps not very nice, but that's the reality of my experience, is that, of course, uh, let's take uh, the side of the e Balkan countries. Uh, it's not a very fair negotiation. Um, it's, it's not a very balanced, it's not a diplomatic negotiation. It's not a negotiation. It's just that you want to get into the EU. There are requirements to this, and you have to fulfill them. So, I mean, of course, no one really says that so bluntly, but that's the basis. And if there is not the sincere will of the candidate country to make all the efforts to fulfill the requirements, then nothing will happen. And this is my experience from the past negotiation. It has been the case all the time. So, of course, I know that perhaps sometimes uh, it's been easier, uh, let's say, for instance, when in 1995, when we welcomed uh, Austria, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, and Finland, uh, of course, the degree of cohesion between these countries and the existing EU was much bigger than the one we have nowadays with the existing EU and the Balkan countries. But uh, it has always been the case. So the dynamic starts from a very deliberate transparty support of the civil society, political will of the country to make all the efforts that are necessary. 
So this is not a negotiation. This is the way it goes. So if you don't do this, if you start to negotiate, say, oh, yes, blah, 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 it's not going to work. So that's it. So I have to repeat it. It's been made clear. It's not very nice because, of course, every country has his own, let's say, pride. And, and of course, and it's not very easy to, to, to understand that uh, perhaps you are asked to do this thing and this. But this is the way it goes, because you want to become part of a bigger part. And if this bigger part does not want to weaken itself, you have to fulfill the conditions to be part. So that's the way it is. From this point of view here in the region, the um, promise, I have to say, uh, came into a, in, So generally, this promise comes after a very strong event. Uh, when I talk about the countries in 2004, it was uh, who entered the EU in 2004. It was after the fall of uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the uh, Eastern uh, group that was, uh, let's say, under the influence of the Soviet Union. And these countries, of course, had only one wish, which was to get into the EU. And it was not questioned by anyone at that time. I'm so sorry, Mr. Ambassador. Can I ask you to uh, maybe wrap it up? Okay, so, so, we can, uh, so, yeah. uh, so I want to say this, so, so, so uh, this was the case. Um, and so this, you need to have the will. Uh, here it started in 2000, after the fall of Milosevic, that's very clear, and that committed the whole region, although Milosevic, I mean, was a uh, Serbian, as you know. Uh, then we have to do work on our side. Uh, we, of course, France proposed the new methodology, you know, uh, is it to propose something else as uh, EU integration? No. Uh, it is to propose it step by step. So to show, for instance, a more concrete benefit of EU accession be before you get it all at the end. And I would give you an example of making it concrete, make EU image more popular. Like, for instance, nowadays in Serbia, uh, the high education system is completely aligned with the EU. There is a complete mobility on both sides. Uh, then you can ask students, is it good, is it not good? And I think the students in, EU, in, in, in Serbia are perhaps the best supporters of uh, uh, EU integration because they know what it means. Uh, was it delaying the process? Uh, uh, yes, four months, that's it. So we started in 2000 and uh, it's right that perhaps France came out with this request of the two methodology too late uh, we should perhaps have asked it six months ago, but in fact, the president required it in October. We adopted it in March. Did it? Did the government in Northern Macedonia topple because of that? No. Did it delay the process? Four months. Okay. And now we have this new methodology, and I think, as I told you, it's more convincing. It's uh, uh, it, it's more political also, and then I could get into what goes on during enlargement negotiation in the enlargement group in Brussels, and I can tell you a lot about this. And this is a very bureaucratic project, uh, I mean, of course, discussion. The, 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 the thing I wanted to say about the new methodology is, of course, now that we have proposed it, and now that it's been accepted by uh, all the con con candidate countries, including the ones who had started negotiations like Montenegro and Serbia, of course, these two countries deserve to be explained how it works. And this is what we are still waiting for from Brussels, and we don't have. And this is a bit disappointing. We keep repeating that because everybody has to fulfill its part of the job. Uh, Maybe we can stop here. And, and uh, no, of I, course, no, I just want to say two things uh, about France's position. We have to show, do we want the Balkan countries into the EU in terms of French public opinion? I don't know. It's not a subjective discussion. Nobody cares. Uh, so what we have to do is, of course, and this is the what I read from this very good uh, study in French by uh, Open Society, um, that you ha it starts by making EU in France more popular, notwithstanding the question of the Balkan countries. And this is very important, because if you don't like EU, you don't like EU with or without the Balkans. <laughs> 
you are against anything that talks about EU. So this is a first challenge. And I would say that sometimes France is criticized about its switch to reform the EU internally. But I mean, this open society uh, uh, study goes even beyond this, uh, this. It shows that we have to make EU more, uh, more, more um, uh, attractive. And the second Let's, point is Sorry, that can we, we can we stop now? Because really, we need to move and, on to the panel. This one, yes, but let me just finish on this. So that's making EU more attractive and making the Balkans more attractive to our public opinion. And this is what President Macron is doing, first of all, for instance, in traveling to Belgrade in July 2020, uh, 12, uh, 2019, uh, 18 years after the previous president, who was uh, Jacques Chirac. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Stay with us and you can, uh, of course, add comments uh, after. Uh, all the panelists have talked. Uh, you mentioned this study. This is perfect because I would like to start this first panel on the French point of view with Surgeon and uh, this study. If you could uh, walk us through the main findings. Yeah, um, thanks, Marion. Uh, so, exactly two years ago, uh, a month after the ratification of the historic PRESPA agreement in the Greek Parliament, I was speaking at an event uh, on the Western Balkans in uh, Paris. And the event was organized by Igor Bandovich, coincidentally, uh, Courrier des Balkans and Maison de l'Europe uh, in Paris. And just to remind ourselves, throughout 2019, France was opposed to the opening of the accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania. And what we could hear at that event from officials of the ruling La République en Marche, um, both publicly, but also privately, was that they were not ready to risk being penalized in the European elections if they were seen as pro-enlargement. So blocking enlargement at that point was declaratively, if we listen to the deputies, to the members of parliament from the ruling party was a defensive strategy. So what we all had until this research was generalized surveys where people were just asked whether they are for or against enlargement without really prompting their knowledge and deeper opinions about it. And according to these, France um, has one of the highest rates of uh, popular disapproval of Western Balkans countries joining the EU. In a 2019 Eurobarometer, and our research confirms this exact number, 58% of the French were against it. So this is comparable to the opinion in Germany and Austria where 57% uh, were also opposed. But despite that, the governments in Berlin and Vienna, contrary to Paris, if I might say, uh, strongly favored the opening of these negotiations at the time. So um, and, uh, what also was really striking for me when we embarked on this research was that no political party in France has ever done targeted polling on Western Balkans enlargement, yet it seemed that in 2019, the politics was, um, the policy on it was driven by internal politics. So we decided to do a proper research for them. And uh, if you could maybe please show uh, slide number one. And uh, so we applied uh, a mixed methodology, basically public opinion surveys and um, focus groups uh, that were conducted um, uh, at the end of September last year in Lyon. And uh, uh, the, we, we used a very large sample of 2,025 people. And um, we took into account, uh, not to go into the details on the methodology, but the classic, all the classical parameters, so age, sex, education, but also political preferences and regional representation of the respondents. And uh, so what are the main points, really? Um, maybe if you could please uh, share slide number two, is that uh, the issue... Uh, is not at all important uh, to the French opinion. Maybe only if you see 22% of the population are against enlargement and this issue is salient, this issue is important for them. For the rest, this is not the case. So uh, if, you, if you talk about the hard contrarians, you can talk only about uh, this 22%. And then maybe if you could show the next slide, please. Uh, the comparison with Turkey is striking. 53% uh, um, of the French, when asked whether, uh, no, I, I think this is, um, 
Yes. Uh, so 53 percent uh, uh, when asked uh, when the, whether the accession of Turkey to the EU would change their life, they said yes, and uh, almost double less uh, was the case for the Western Balkans. So another thing that uh, Mr. Ambassador mentioned as well uh, from the study is that attitudes on the Western Balkans do not reflect specific views on the region or prejudices about the region, but more general views uh, of the French about the EU. So contrary to what many of us maybe even thought is that there is no significant portion of the French electorate that is pro-EU, but against enlargement. You know, this argument, we don't want the new Macron, Macron uh, new, um, pardon, <laughs> Orbans uh, into the EU. Uh, that argument was uh, um, an elite argument. This is not what the population have on their mind so much. So, and uh, little importance of the issue to the population has to be combined with little knowledge uh, about the Balkans. So we talked a lot about the new methodology. If you can please show the next slide, uh, 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 just to see if that's the right one. Sorry, uh, uh, no, the uh, the one after that, even please. Yes. So um, so we talked about the new methodology, but the French only 38 percent of the respondents knew that France um, uh, has a veto power to stop new EU members joining the EU. So 62% uh, think that other countries can overrule France and that, let's say, Serbia, Albania, mm, you know, Kosovo, Bosnia can join the EU. So, uh, 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 and uh, also on uh, the next slide, please, if you, um, we ask them to locate the Western Balkans on the map and the number of people that were able to do so was staggeringly low. So, um, but what is, I think, more interesting here, because uh, not of all of us are into maps so much, but uh, uh, when we show the map to the respondents of the focus group, um, first, we didn't show them the map, and they discussed about the Balkans in very abstract terms without prompting, you know, without wishing to influence them. But then towards the end, they showed them the maps, and 43% of the participants at the focus groups change their opinion a bit about it. And, and here is something really interesting resurfaced, which is that um, for across all groups, really, across all groups, um, uh, including some of the hard opponents of enlargement, participants recognize that the integration of the countries of the Western Balkans into the EU would bring a geopolitical advantage to France. So I was behind the double glass and I could not believe this really uh, person who belonged to the 22% of the hard contrarians. When she saw the map, she said, my God, but how come they're not still in? How is this possible? When she realized that uh, the Balkans is a whole in uh, surrounded by the EU member state. And uh, just uh, on the next slide, please, before I conclude is uh, experience with the region really matters. So um, uh, only 10% of the French has traveled to the Western, one of the Western Balkans countries and 18% know somebody, um, well, thinks that know somebody from the Western Balkans countries. Maybe they know more, but they're not aware of their origin. But so, uh, and if you then go uh, uh, into um, different approval and salience groups, uh, so, uh, to the, uh, uh, the there is a disproportionate number of people in the high approval, high salience, high importance groups. So those that really support the Western Balkans EU membership and those for whom this is real really matters that went to the region or know some from the region. Which means that really we, we from the region have to get the French to know our region. The more they know, the more they support it. Uh, and uh, to conclude. I think because everybody has the po politics on their mind and fear that the French government may be penalized by the electorate for moving forward with enlargement, did not find really any basis in this research. If the political strategy of the president and his party uh, was and is defensive, so not to lose votes because of enlargement, 
there is no political sense whatsoever for France to block the candidate countries all along their way towards EU membership. On the, so in that sense, yes, maybe the new methodology is useful for Brussels. I don't think they're very happy with applying it, but it doesn't make any difference to the French uh, popular opinion. And supporting Western Balkan CEO accession, or better, simply not opposing to it, would not hurt President Macron's chances for re-election in 2022. Other things may, but this will not. And moreover, you, yes. Uh, can we? No. Yes, you can. Uh, uh, you can. <laughs> just to to keep going from this, uh, Sebastian Grico, we see from this study that it's not an issue for people, but it seemed to be then just an issue for politicians. How did we got it wrong, or did they got it wrong? Uh, you're still muted. Yep. Yep. All right. Yes, hello everyone. It, it is true that actually this is a mistake. So what was said by the study, this is a mistake to believe there was a, we should put politics into that issue. But we should look maybe, we should put all the issue in the national context. And uh, we, to understand it uh, largely, uh, to understand the current uh, institutional and political framework in France, it is worth reminding as a general remark that since 2002, the constitutional reform that has replaced the presidential seven years mandate by a five years mandate and has also inversed the electoral calendar of the legislative, the parliamentary election, altogether, this has increased an already strong half presidential regime. And uh, you can find irrational that EU enlargement issues could be impacted by such national consideration. But I believe we have to bear in mind that that, that fact when considering 15 years of a growing people's negative perception over European Union enlargement. And when you realize that today, France is ruled by a president who was elected on the promise that no political cleavage is relevant anymore and that you can win by being at the same time, the right and the left. And as a direct consequence of all these elements, uh, a president has to be prepared for the next presidential election at the middle of his mandate, which is declined in the, the Macron's case by maintaining the illusions he belongs to the left during the first part of his mandate, and then he belongs to the right on the second part. And as a matter of fact, it is demonstrated also by the important shift of his electoral base, mostly from the left when he, when he was elected in 2017, and today his electoral base is on the right side. And meanwhile, the both, both traditional parties of both left and right are struggling actually to survive and reestablish some kind of unity and some sense of new vision. While in the same time, Macron's strategy has helped the emergence of extreme right and extreme left, against whom he comes to place himself as the only safeguard of the Republic next year. So having in mind that description of the context, we should recall also that um, in 2005 already, the, in order to ensure in 2005 the vote of the right of the right side for the referendum on the treaty establishing a constitution for Europe, the president Chirac had amended the French constitution with an article requiring the organization of a referendum for the next memberships. And this was only to accommodate his own political family on the right side and their specific fears for the pro prospect of the integration of Turkey. And after the failure of the French vote in May 2005, this is President Sarkozy in 2008, who will amend the constitutional provision by ruling out its implementation for Croatia and by introducing the option of a three-fifth qualified majority vote at the parliament in order to avoid a, a referendum. And second, uh, let's recall that Sofia summit of May 2018 uh, was exactly a year before European election. And so by reviving the outdated uh, debate of enlarging and deepening, Macron was actually attempting to neutralize any occurrence of that question into the national debate, what Surgeon could testify uh, later on during that year, as he said before. So, 
again, guided by some misperception he had, he thought that he, could, he cannot control this debate. He, he could not control the debate if, uh, and he will lose the support of the right-wing electorate. So probably if we remember beginning of uh, 2018, already a few months uh, in January, his early supporter and spokesperson of the government was lively contested by the head of the right-wing party who was uh, uh, stating that the enlargement process has killed Europe. And in April 2019, for the first time during the debate for the European election, the heads of the party's list had to take a stance on enlargement and precisely on Serbia's prospect of integration. And except two candidates, including the left-wing one, all the other candidates were against or reserved, including the former State Secretary of European Affairs, who during the debate answered only by some technocrat technocratic banalities and by targeting the right wing. And finally, let's recall the fall 2019 when Paris said no to Skopje and Tirana. It was the exact timing of Macron's mid-mandate official term to the right, when he published successively two key interviews. The first for the conservative weekly uh, Valeur Actuelle, Today's Values, at the end of October, when he developed its thoughts about immigration and communitarianism in a way fitting with the conservatives. And we, and we can note that by doing as such, he intends to prevent further slipping of the right towards the far right. Then a week later, we got the interview in, for The Economist, when not only the brain death of NATO could resonate differently in the Western Balkan, but also had shocked Bosnia when the president had depicted this country as a ticking bomb uh, of jihadism. So I will not go back to the study because that Sergian has perfectly uh, described already, but I would like to maybe to um, just to compare, uh, to, to comp by linking the, the study to the findings of a new study released exactly this week by the Foundation Jean Jaurès and the Frédéric Ebert Stiftung the subject of the survey was to evaluate among European citizens the degree of understanding of the concept of European sovereignty. And the survey was conducted in eight member states, representing 75% of the overall European population. And we can find some correlation with our study uh, that could be probably further elaborated. So without first, without developing on the surprising answers to what sovereignty relates to in French people's mind compared to the Germans or other nations, I note that the notion of sovereignty sounds very little positive for the French, only 29%, but very positively for the Germans, 73%, with a European average of 46%. Regarding the specific subject of the survey, what is European sovereignty? French have a lesser good understanding of the concept than the understanding of national sovereignty, or even lesser understanding than the well-known but badly understood strategic autonomy. So it results that European sovereignty remains a positive concept only to 41% of the French respondents against a European average of 52%. So more than half of the French assess that European sovereignty is a contradictory notion because sovereignty is national above all, according to them. So having said that, if there is in France an antagonism when associating Europe with sovereignty, there is, however, no re rejection of the meaning the notions intends to define. So the most salient outcome of the survey is that overall, Europeans see a high complementarity between European and national sovereignties. And they expect that both sovereignties be strengthened, including the French, they want that. Overall, European sovereignty is desired and determined primarily to deal with terrorist threats, climate change and sanitary threats. So therefore, an indirect connection with our subject of the day. Uh, when French mentioned in the study that Sergian has, de has, de has described, the following difficulties to ensure this European sovereignty, so weaknesses of European institution, pressure of third states, uh, which have no interest to see a strong Europe emerging. 
Here, the new survey uh, matches with the expectation identified by our own survey about French opinion towards enlargement, because both studies lead to the expectations for a functional and trusty European Union with enough capacities to protect from the influence of external powerful states. And regarding the overall opinion throughout the eight member states, member states they are almost equal everywhere. People identify that the primary conditions to guarantee the European sovereignty are the following, a prosperous economy, common security defense policy, European production in strategic areas, starting with food and health, proper European energy resources, protection of European values, control of European Union external borders. So these, these last outcomes of this uh, survey released this week bring me to conclude that, conclude to that eventually enlargements of the European Union will not be a misperceived issue anymore in France and among other member states, once Western Balkans will be viewed, will be viewed by as, as partners contributing to all of these key areas. We know this is already the case, but uh, much remains to achieve uh, in order to convince people that this is really the case. And so, thank you, Sebastian. We we heard the ambassador mentioning uh, efforts with Serbia, for instance, in uh, with the uh, French president visiting and uh, a lot of a lot intensified talks uh, between France and Serbia. But um, does how does this play in uh, bringing back the EU enlargement into the discourse in France? Loic, do you have a? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Marion. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the French strategy for the Western Balkans is very well known among the French public opinion. And uh, although this strategy has uh, many positive as aspects, uh, visits from ministers, uh, the, the French Agency for Development and everything like this, it's very positive. I, I have nothing against it. The, the, the point is, however, that uh, this strategy uh, uh, cannot hide the fact that uh, France played a negative role uh, regarding the enlargement process over the last uh, three years. Why? Because uh, Surgeon said uh, it is an elite argument that pro-EU would be against enlargement. Well, yes, but elite is ruling the country and enlargement process uh, is an elite process. So uh, it, is, it, it is legitimate, I mean, this is it. it exists. Uh, you can be pro-EU and against enlargement because you think that enlargement will uh, impede the EU to be a political uh, union. And because uh, uh, the, the UK was always in favor of enlargement, including Turkey, because uh, the UK would think that the, 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 uh, the more numbers there would be and the less political it could be. Uh, so in France, you can... There is this pro-EU argument to be against uh, enlargement. This, is, this exists and uh, um, this is consistent. And this is most probably what President Macron thinks, which is why, which is, uh, which is why the new methodology uh, is not enough per se, although we still don't know how it will be implemented. And if it can only work if, and it's a big if, uh, everyone uh, plays fair. So candidates, but also all the members. Otherwise, you will only complicate things uh, further and makes things uh, even uh, more unfair, as um, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur said. Uh, to this pro-EU argument, you can answer a very simple thing. Croatia integrated in 2013 and no one noticed. No, no one can say that the political social, uh, uh, financial, demographic, whatever you want, balance of the EU changed by an inch uh, after Croatia integrated. So, and, and the same would work for uh, Montenegro or for uh, Macedonia, all things equals uh, aside. So uh, this pro-EU argument exists, but then you have, to, you have to be clear about that. You don't have to say, it's a matter of methodology, or it's a matter of uh, doing reforms within the EU first, because the research shows that it is because you enlarge that you deepens, not the other way around. 
Uh, but again, uh, and as far as public opinion is concerned, in politics, perceptions of facts are facts per se. It is true, and I, this is an intuition I had before the study, that uh, the, the, the uh, President Macron or his party would not lose one voter uh, by opening negotiations to Albania and, and Macedonia. But the fact that they believe the opposite, despite every uh, evidence, matters because per their perceptions matter. And I remember in this European campaign, uh, Nathalie Loiseau, who, who was then uh, the minister for Europe, she went on radio and she said, I quote, I am proud that I blocked Albania and uh, Macedonia. So what they're afraid of is that the far right would uh, make a campaign uh, over saying, oh, look at President Macron, he opened the European Union to Albania. Because uh, I mentioned Albania, why? Because a surgeon said about image of countries and people who have experience in the region, uh, uh, image matters. Whatever reforms Albania would do or not do, I'm afraid that Albania suffers from uh, much worse image than uh, North Macedonia, for instance. North Macedonia doesn't have a strong image, whether positive or negative. You can work on that. You can build a success story on that. You could, at least. This is what I uh, advocated in 2017. I wasn't listened to. Uh, so perceptions matters, uh, image matters. And I mean, don't forget, I'm, I'm going to be harsh, but we still have, uh, and it's related to the topic, you'll see why. We still have today uh, kids in Syria under the age of five with their mothers who went to uh, went with ISIS. And everything was settled to take them back. And at the end, the president decided not to. Why? Because polls uh, showed that the French were opposed. Okay? So you take the decision to let kids over there, maybe dying, uh, because you fear that the French public opinion will not understand your choice. Everything was settled. It could have been done, and it's not. So you can only imagine uh, if you think that you will lose uh, points, you will lose voters because you open to Albania, you can only imagine what your reaction will be. So uh, this is something that, and it's the same for the visa. Sorry, I want to mention the visa for Kosovo because the perception here is the same. The perception is that if you open, uh, if you, uh, uh, yes, open uh, for Kosovo, uh, uh, which the European Parliament, the European Commission, and most of European countries agree on, uh, then thousands of uh, citizens from Kosovo will come and invade France and uh, uh, steal jobs and everything. Uh, of course, nothing of this will happen. But again, perception matters. If you think that this is what could happen, then you take the decision not, not to move and the only uh, midway for this was the methodology. I still believe that France spent uh, a huge political credit for that on a topic that is not that much important to them. This is important to Germany, but it's not that important to France because historically France has not, it's not been a leader on, on enlargement for obvious reasons. Uh, so methodology is now France's responsibility to make it work. And I'm worried because uh, uh, France took the leadership place on this, but then a few months ago, Bulgaria for illegitimate and for internal reasons blocked North Macedonia. And as far as I know, Germany tried to pressure Bulgaria, but France did not. So France did, is not taking its responsibilities over enlargement after it took the leadership position uh, to change the methodology and to put enlargement against again uh, um, at the map at the, at the first place. And the last um, moment of truth, if I may, is that if ever the negotiations, if ever the, 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 there's no opening in 2021, as you know, France is taking the EU presidency in 2022, it will be during the presidential campaign. So if ever it doesn't move in 2000, uh, this year, uh, okay, it will be interesting to see whether there is one, one little place for uh, enlargement issue and for Western Balkans issues uh, within the program uh, and the priorities of 
uh, the French uh, EU presidency. So I'll uh, stop here if, if there are uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Loïc. Uh, maybe to the ambassador right now, since you mentioned um, the, the visa liberalization for Kosovo, and because in your introduction, Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned the fact that uh, with this new methodology, you can get rewards for progress that you make. I, I think in the, in the region, there is this uh, feeling that even when progress are made and even uh, sacrifices are made to answer the EU's uh, requirements, the reward is not coming. Well, I think I quoted the example of, for instance, high education. I mean, all the reforms have been made here. The, sy the system is uh, just uh, completely compatible with EU and they get all the advantages they need. Then when the efforts are not made, they don't get the advantages. When you talk about visa in Kosovo, I don't want to commit myself because I'm not ambassador of France to Kosovo, but uh, first of all, Kosovo is not committed into a process of EU accession. And the second point is that there are uh, special conditions about liberalization of visa that are not fulfilled by Kosovo. So this is where we are. So when you get the advantage, I mean, when you do the efforts, you get the advantage in counterpart. It has always worked like that. If we have any question from the audience, uh, you can send them through the uh, Q and A, please. Uh, maybe just, maybe yeah. just the, if there are no questions, just to uh, add something. I mean, uh, I think nobody. Well, I mean, it's not very pertinent to criticize the new methodology per se because we have it. But to me, um, it always seemed a bit as the cosmetic exercise, because uh, if you don't have the ability to say, uh, circumvent the Bulgarian veto, uh, unjustified veto from last uh, year blocking North Macedonia, if you don't have the qualified majority vote uh, introduced into the uh, intermediary stages of the EU accession talks, then uh, you cannot have the new methodology or any methodology from that, for that matter really work. I mean, now we can talk, talk about how will the Q qualified majority work per, in practice, but I think th th this is one of the solutions because with the unanimity right now, it's really complicated to be just, if you want to be just towards the countries. Uh, we have a comment and question from uh, Nicola Bizel. President Macron conditioned further enlargement to internal reforms of the EU. What does it mean concretely? Does it mean that the, the efforts of the Balkans depends on reforms on which they have no control? And what is the state of play of the internal reforms of the EU? Uh, yes, well, I think one of the elements mentioned in the survey of open society is that you, may, you have to convince more public opinion in France about the EU. Well, so one of the challenge of President Macron, because he was elected on the basis of a very strong EU orientation, which is worth mentioning because it's not the case for all the uh, candidates to the presidential election in France. But it was clear without doubt, and it was said, and it's, it, it, I mean, this is the process he's following. So, I mean, it's interesting to know that. Uh, uh, so he was committed to EU. He was committed to the fact that he thinks that uh, the relevant level for France uh, is EU nowadays. And uh, making uh, the public opinion more convinced that EU is necessary is a challenge uh, that he intends to fulfill with EU reform, making it closer to the public opinion. So this reform is ongoing. So it's not something like, in 10 years, we will reach a new treaty. No, this is not what he means. He means let's do concrete steps. Some of these steps have been made, for instance, include in trade agreements between EU and third countries that we have in EU so that there is no dumping, social dumping. Conditions about fulfillment of conditions about environment so that we have strict conditions in France, uh, in, in EU, 
and the third country who want to have a balanced relate, trade relationship with EU need also to impose this condition. This is one reform that is already going on because now we impose these rules on third countries when we, we negotiate. Defense, I mean, there is the creation of a defense fund to make more investment in the field of defense. This is part of the strategic autonomy. This is also a reform which is ongoing. Different rules on the social protection in EU. Uh, this is what is going on. So yes, EU reforms is, uh, let's say, it's not a requirement about uh, a Balkans country accession, but it's a necessary element for EU itself. And what Macron says, said when he, when he came to Belgrade is that this thing plus accession process of the Balkan to the EU is a parallel, uh, is a parallel uh, way. So there has never been any condition of saying this has to be done before that. And I have to tell you something is that seeing the step at which the reforms are made generally in Balkan countries to access the EU, it would be very difficult to think that the, reform, the EU reform that is ongoing will succeed or come uh, after the necessary reforms are made here for the countries to access to the EU, which means that it would block them from entering to the EU. So I'm sorry to say that these are two parallel steps, and I'm quite sure that the EU reinforcements that Macron has committed itself to, and which is ongoing, will come before the conditions are met for the countries of the region to enter the EU. And the reform of the EU is not a long process, it's something which is ongoing. Thank you. We have a more question, just a second for the, the other panelists maybe. Um, could, uh, could it be that France is uh, blocking for their enlargement because it's trying to uh, preserve the, it, the power balance that is uh, currently in the EU and uh, is specifically trying to prevent the German economy from becoming even stronger? We have a comment that uh, Germany has been the number one beneficiary of the 2004 EU enlargement. Yeah, Sebastian? Yes, but sorry again. Um, it's true It's true that uh, France, as Loïc said, uh, France has a big responsibility now be because of the new methodology. So there will be a need for bigger, uh, bigger, um, uh, bigger involvement of France in order to convince that this new methodology is not another excuse to, to delay the process of uh, integration. And obviously, sometimes we have the feeling that uh, France uh, is using Western Balkan as a kind of bargain with Germany related to other issues. So I don't know what, I, what it has in mind, but, but uh, I know that after one year for the national election, he will have in mind to portray the president, to portray himself as the one to ref who has reformed the European Union. Uh, because France will uh, chair European Union at this time. And uh, I believe that he will try to, 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 to make that this new methodology as a kind of, uh, as a kind of progress uh, for the Western Balkans and for the European Union. Um, but I suppose there are a lot of contradiction again. And uh, again, he will try also at the same time to, to, to be reluctant on any kind of uh, emergence of the debate of, over enlargement because again of the, this misperception that this could have an impact on the, on the electorate. We have also a question regarding, uh, sorry, Loïc, did you wanna react? No, it's related, but uh, uh, it is true that, okay, you can always tell a country you're not doing enough. If the 27 of us, of the member states were today to uh, do the process again, not half, would, would, would succeed. Why? Because the candidates are now paying the mistakes that once you remember, uh, you're almost free to do whatever you want. So the candidates today are paying for Bulgaria. They are unfairly paying for Orban. And I would like the member states to say openly, we do not want another Orban. It is a legitimate argument to me, provided uh, you come to push those in the region that are not in this position. In his Sorbonne speech, President Macron said, and which is why 
uh, it raised a lot of hope in the region. Uh, we will struggle against illiberalism. Well, what's the result? We blocked the door to Skopje, which is by far the least illiberal uh, uh, government in the region, who, which did a lot, I mean, including changing the name, okay? It's a lot to ask to a country. Uh, so it's a matter of coherence. The process is unfair because candidates are paying for things that they are not responsible of. But at least uh, the Koreans would uh, uh, demand that uh, those who are doing the most efforts are uh, encouraged and not pushed back. Push back, sorry. Thank you. We have a question regarding uh, the fact that um, France will take the presidency of uh, the EU Council in 2022. Is this going to uh, bring the enlargement back to the table? Or is this... Okay, Loic thinks no, this is not happening. No, no, because, because uh, France uh, and President Macron uh, got uh, I mean, successful reforms within the EU. The, if you think about the negotiations related to COVID, related to uh, to and uh, to um, uh, sorry environment in 2019 and in this year, uh, convincing Germany to have common bonds and everything. So those are very strong successes, and those are priorities for the French presidency as well as cybersecurity. Uh, will be also a priority. So this presidency will be a presidency about showing that President Macron uh, managed to have results, uh, including and especially over uh, reluctant uh, Germany over the last year. So uh, I do not think that the Western Balkans and, in, and enlargement will be a priority, but it will be interesting to see whether it will be mentioned at some point if it is not dealt with uh, this year. Maybe just uh, to uh, to bring, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, you know, I'll be sure just to bring the, the issue back to the internal politics because in the French presidency comes right uh, at the moment where we'll be, let's say, um, in the last stages of the presidential campaign in the country. So. Uh, to expect uh, some big breakthrough on enlargement uh, would be surprising. I'm not excluding it because if they listen to our study, they could do it. But uh, but uh, I would be concerned if you look at the you know the political dynamics back in 2019 and uh, and uh, I, I I don't think really uh, there was a question on Germany and some sort of uh, competition in the Balkans. I don't think that that really is. Uh, uh, an issue at stake here, uh, but uh, uh, you know you can inverse the argument that uh, uh, we that our study makes that uh, you know whatever the French government does on enlargement, uh, especially you know during the EU accession talks, doesn't have an impact, a negative impact on internal politics. Well, you can inverse the argument, and what I'm not saying that this is the case, but hypothetically this could be the case. And what if the French? politicians had exactly the same intuition as Loic when we started this study and if we if they knew that the issue is not salient then it's not also salient if you push it it will not turn away uh, progressive voters nobody cares about this issue but if you earn a little you know uh, right wing uh, medal uh, on your uh, way on your suit uh, by opposing, you know, uh, Western Balkans countries, maybe somebody could think that it pays off, but it doesn't really either. I think that, that that's that's the point um, here. Uh, and for the ambassador, uh, I will uh, leave you to to comment as well. But uh, we have a specific question: Will the enlargement process be among priorities of French EU presidency? Yes. So first of all, I'd like to 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 remind you that uh, I mean, I used to be in charge of presidency in 2008, and this was before the treaty, the new treaty, uh, Lisbon Treaty. Uh, things have changed a little. Is it good? Is it not good? I don't know. But one has to say that the role of the rotating presidency 
nowadays in 2022. And so we are going to experience for the first time this new treaty, I have to say, uh, is a bit different than when it was in 2008. So, I mean, in 2008, as a presidency, you had all the elements of the agenda in hand because the president in France was president of the European Council, because the minister for foreign affairs was president of the Foreign Affairs Council, etc., etc. You know that now we have standing institution, president of the European Council, uh, uh, external action service, etc. So I have to say, is it good or not, that it was the idea to organize more continuity uh, and not changing from one agenda to another every six months. So uh, I don't want to uh, diminish the role of the uh, European, uh, of the French presidency of the council in 2022, but uh, let's say it's not as it was. I mean, it's not just like President Macron will say, we do this in January and that's it. It's not working that way, I have to say. So it's a matter of influence, it's a matter of preparation and so on. So that's what I wanted to say. You don't just do one thing because you want to do that, because you have the EU presidency of the Council. But still, it has an influence. I think all policies will be priorities. The question is, what for? So uh, we are going to aim at more prosperity. We are going to aim at more protection for European citizens. We are going to aim at developing the, this agenda of strategic autonomy. autonomy. All policies will be part of this agenda and enlargement, as long as it contributes to the, these elements that I've mentioned, will be a priority. But one has to say that the driving force for making the enlargement possible relies in the region. I mean, if the countries do the necessary steps, there will be progress. It's not working the way that I sometimes hear to say, you'll be in the EU in this date. I think I was quite clear at the beginning of my introduction, which was unfortunately a bit too long, but this is what I said. So the dynamic, so there is a will to accompany, but the dynamic comes from here. So is it going to be fast? Is it going to be not fast? It depends more on the capacity of the region than from Brussels itself. But we, are, we, we will be, of course, ready to accommodate every uh, positive step. Thank you. Uh, we are slightly over um, our time, so I think uh, we can stop now and uh, move on to the next panel. Thank you all uh, for participating. I know you have to leave, uh, Mr. Ambassador, but uh, if the other panelists can stay and uh, maybe uh, also join the discussion in the next panel, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, so we're moving to the second side of the story. We have heard a lot about uh, the French position and uh, context, but now let's look at uh, what it means from the regional uh, perspective. Uh, let's start maybe with um, Zoran Neshev because Macedonia, as uh, Loic mentioned, really feels like uh, the, the, the saddest part of the, the whole story. Can you maybe start by telling what is the feeling now in North Macedonia regarding France attitudes? And uh, do you see any strategy going uh, in the direction of the, of the enlargement? Okay, uh, thank you, Marian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, my contribution will have two points. One is on you know, the French position on vis-a-vis -vis enlargement. And here I will specifically talk about North Macedonia. And the second one will be on uh, the French approach in general politically towards, towards the region. So um, on the first one, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I want to believe in everything that the French government is saying, completely. But I have to question that, right? You know, not to, to be a fool, I have to question this, uh, this approach. So trust between the partners in the process is essential if we want to have progress in whatever thing we talk in, in politics. So let's start from the beginning. Our first uh, recommendation to open accession negotiation was in 2009. I was working back then for 
for the government in the Secretariat for European Affairs. We have been told, resolve the issue with Greece and you will start accession negotiation. More than 10 years, we have been waiting to, to, uh, to start negotiation. And finally, there was a political will in Skopje and in Athens to resolve, to resolve this issue. None of the EU member states, with the exception of Germany, didn't really assist it in the resolution of this issue. Finally, it is resolved. However, the country still has an open accession negotiation. So it's a bit difficult on this point to believe what the French government is saying. Second point, what the French government is saying, we want to make the process, the accession process, more credible, more transparent. And because of this, we need to have a new methodology because the existing one is not producing the necessary results. Completely agree. Let's change the methodology. We have waited for 10 years. We can wait one year more, or as the ambassador said, four months. Although, you know, that's also very questionable. But, okay, France has pushed hard to have this new methodology. We were hearing voices actively about, uh, you know, la grande retour dans le Balkan by the French. The announcement and the implementation of the French strategy for the Western Balkans. And finally, the visit of Macron to the region, although the country that he has visited is not, you know, the best is not sending the right signal to all the others. That's question, but let's put it like that. At least the French president came to the region, right? So we have now the new methodology. We have, we have the strategy, but we don't have with whom to implement this new methodology because the intention was to start with North Macedonia and Albania because now they will start accession negotiation, right? So we're, and we haven't seen any kind of strong push by the French in order for these two countries to open accession negotiations. On the contrary, even what the Bulgarians are saying is that there are bigger member states behind our position, which I completely question. You know, they can leave that position and then see who, is, who are these big member states. But still, this is what the Bulgarians are saying. And this is even public. So, why I'm questioning this, although I want to trust the position of the French government, why I'm questioning? Because, you know, this is like with a family, right? Let's put that one of, 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 of the parents is, um, is the French government. You have worked so much. You have put so much of your credibility and the credibility of the European Union in order to, you know, to have a kid. And then when the kid comes, you are nowhere to be found. If this is, you know, the honest policy towards the region, then we are not talking about honesty. And then trust, trust is nowhere to be found. And with that, the credibility is being lost. We cannot, uh, and we cannot find it. We, here we are talking about North Macedonia. So we are talking about the good people in the Western Balkans. So if you cannot, if you, not, you cannot prove on a European level that you can push or have a success story with the best people in the Western Balkans, then what is else there to show, right? At least this is how I'm going to see it. You know, we have changed our constitutional name and this is just to open accession negotiation. This is not for closing the, ne the negotiation. And then with this kind of loss of credibility, the lack of credibility, please, I invite, you know, Macron to go in Belgrade and say to Vucic, you know, resolve the issue with Kosovo and tomorrow, or, you know, let's say in a foreseeable future, you will become a member of the European Union. If someone believes him, then, then he's on a good route. But I don't see if, the, if this, I don't see this, uh, this happen. So we have heard the ambassador that it is 
of, you know, in French own interest to see the enlargement with the countries of, of the Western Balkans. So therefore, my question would be, is this situation, the, the existing status quo in which we are stuck all, not only Macedonia, but all the region, is what the French are looking for? Because obviously, uh, you know, if you are not satisfied with this situation, you will do something in order to change, right? The situation, if you are not, you know, if this goes against the priorities, what has the French government done in order to change the status quo? Because we have seen that the situation is even more problematic now. It's not that these two countries are, you know, let's say blocked, but it's that now it's an internal struggle within the council. Previously it was between the commission and the council. Now it's within the council. So you have blockage by Bulgaria, which is additionally blocked by Czech Republic and, and, and Slovakia, in addition to, to, to Austria. So there is no even conclusions on enlargement. So are these in line with the priorities that the French government is saying towards the region and what the government will do in order to change them? This is a very legitimate question that someone needs to answer. And this is all on the accession policy. And I will finish what or more politically, uh, putting the primary, putting the emphasis on Serbia in the French, um, let's say, in the French uh, uh, foreign policy approach towards the region is wrong. At least I don't see any results happening. Maybe it is time to consider a different approach in which other countries from the region will be evaluated or positively promoted for all the things that they have done for the better, for the sake of the region itself. So maybe in order to push Serbia to resolve this issue, which is the last big bilateral issue in the region, you have to work with the others in the region to promote the good neighboring policy and to, and to promote these countries further in whatever it's bilateral relations or in the EU accession, accession policy. That might bear fruit with the Serbian government. Other than that, I really don't see uh, pushing Serbia uh, bilaterally to resolve the issue will work as an approach from, from Kedrse to, uh, uh, to the region. So these are the, these are the two points I wanted to, to take. I would not take more of the time. I'm here to answer any of the Thank questions. Thank you. If you are, if there are any. Thank you, Zoran. Uh, maybe Abba Cella uh, from Albania, since uh, Albania also uh, hit a wall on its way towards the, the EU uh, is, uh, do you have the same feeling in Albania as in uh, North Macedonia? And uh, maybe uh, is this new methodology that France is promoting any help now for Albania to try to move forward and maybe pass this wall? Thank you so much. And I'm really happy that Zoran went first because he gave all the disappointment that we all share. So I, I can, I fully agree with him. And I can say that the sentiment is very much shared uh, in the public opinion and also among us that deal with the European integration of our countries and of our region. Uh, one point that I want to make, and I think it's important though it might be a small point is this uh, re regarding this perceived conflict between enlargement and the deepening and enhancing of the union and whether these are two contradictory processes. I think that uh, by deepening and enhancing the union, the first thing would be to trust, consolidate and empower the institutions of that union. So by disregarding the opinions and the, and the conclusions, for example, of the commission or of the parliament, 
I see a hypocrisy in this, a duality and dichotomy, because if you want to enhance and deepen the union, it means that you invest in the institutions and not contradict them. And one example that was given to us, unfortunately, of this is, for example, when the ambassador mentioned in passing, but I think it's an important thing to address that, for example, Kosovo has not fulfilled the roadmap for visa liberalization, whereas it's the opinion of the institutions of the EU that this has happened. This is just one example, but I want to address the point that uh, while we see this debate or this rhetoric of enhancing the union, we see the behavior of ignoring the institutions of the union. And uh, this goes then to the point that Zoran said that now also this conflict and duality is passing to the council itself, not just between the institutions. Um, I want to address also one point uh, that was uh, made very interesting by Luke uh, Tagores about the, this uh, issue of perceptions matter and image matters. And in the case of Albania, this is a very sensitive issue. Uh, the relationship that our image of the country has with the skepticism of some member countries. You have to understand that the dominant uh, perception here in Albania is that, for example, the Netherlands are a very skeptical country about Albania, and they have made the position quite clear several times, but also France is. But the difference is, in opinion is that the Netherlands is very much engaged, monitoring the reforms, making declarations, uh, supporting a lot of projects here uh, through civil society and others. So it's seen as an opponent that is engaged, while France, it's less clear. It's seen as a skepticism per se, not really following the details or the failures, but just having this over general opinion about the country and then opposing on these grounds. I'm not saying this is legitimate, but as we said, perception matters, so this needs, this needs to be addressed. Uh, one of the questions that you, you posed to us in, in, the, in the invitation and in the program and is what can we do to, to change this? Uh, what, while I'll share uh, Zora's disappointment that yes, we were given the message that there is a new tool, the, the, the new methodology. So with a focus of on rule of law and all these things that admittedly we might have not done enough in the case of Albania where a, a, a dispute was not the matter such as in the case of Macedonia. But then I would be repeating just his argument that we are not, we are not, we are just shown the tool but not given it to work with because we are still stuck in a very, weird status quo of not opening the, the uh, accession negotiations. And now for Albania, we will have elections in April, which means that now we have sort of an additional condition. So it, the, the process needs to go very, very fairly and well for us to hope that, that something will be different. And uh, about what can we do then about the, the matter of the public image of Albania, I think, uh, that here we need a strategy on, on both sides. On our side, um, I, I am very actually sad about this, about the, the image of Albania in France. And I'm really advocated for many years that we need a smart public diplomacy approach on how to counter uh, the media narratives or other narratives, because uh, it's, it's a relationship that has much more than this reduced uh, image of perhaps uh, that is given by the media of organized crime of asylum seekers. You have to remember that France was one of the very few windows open in the West uh, for Albania during this long communist time, this isolated time. And uh, there is a connection that is is goes back and it's rich with the uh, linguistic and cultural uh, connection and relations between the countries. Uh, also the presence of the uh, best Albanian writer Kadare in France and his recognition is an asset that needs to be deployed. But these are all, I think, uh, measures of a secondary nature. The first thing is to address the, the problem about enlargement, and then this can only improve, let's say, uh, the, the pace of it. So I believe uh, in 
a reconsideration of the strategic engagement of France with all the region. And I agree with uh, Zoran's treatment of this perceived special relation between France and Serbia is uh, actually the source of many conspiracies then in, in extremist media of our countries. And so it's actually not, not something positive to consider, but the strategic re-engagement needs to be with, with all the region and with, with all the countries and really to be closer to, to, I think, to the Dutch model of, yes, you can be an opponent, you can be skeptic, but you have to show that you are really monitoring and that you are really assisting for the things to be fixed rather than just looking from like some ivory tower and, and all, always saying no. I'll, I'll stop here and maybe engage in the debate later. Thank you. Um, question now for uh, Jovan Marovic. Uh, Montenegro is a bit further along the path, but also not moving much uh, in the integration process. Uh, now, um, we, since we're talking about France, we have this moment coming up uh, next year of the French presidency. Do you see this as uh, an, an event that the, the country in the region can use to maybe promote themselves, maybe change the narrative, or at least uh, push for France and for the EU to uh, give uh, stronger signs of uh, engagement in the region? Thank you for the question, Median. If you are expecting like a more optimistic view, uh, if, because it comes from the country which is uh, in the European integration process and which came for 30 years during the last years, during the last year, don't expect it because um, there is kind of um, dissatisfaction in, uh, within the civil society in Montenegro because we are. Uh, trying to influence democratization in the country. At least I am in the working group for chapter 23 dealing with the rule of law from the very beginning of the negotiations with the EU. And we are in 2012. So almost nine years Montenegro is trying to, to, to move in the European integration process, but I guess we are part of the package uh, uh, as the European Union sees the Western Balkans. I agree that the perception of the Western Balkan countries is really important and that there is different uh, perception about the different countries in the Western Balkans. Um, but as, as I said, we are the same package and the message which was sent to Albania, North Macedonia during the last year is for the, the whole Western Balkans, not just for Albania and North Macedonia. So that's why I think that the political uh, um, this decision making has a primacy in, in, in the European Union over the merit based uh, uh, decision making, whatever French ambassador or the, the, the decision makers in the EU are saying. Uh, I'm not expecting uh, major developments uh, on the European Union's agenda on the enlargement during this year, but I guess the same applies for the next year and the, the, the very uh, uh, reason for it is that France is taking over EU's presidency. So there are many reasons for it and the, the, some of them are, uh, let's say, objective as the coronavirus crisis, economic crisis, the, the state of reforms in the Western Balkans, and then the, the attitudes of the, of the member states towards the Western Balkans, which are not objective at all. Uh, all of you you already said that the new methodology was published in February last year. Methodology is predominantly based on, on French proposals from the French non paper. So France has to be um, satisfied and happy with the new methodology. So the question is not pushing any pressure on the European Commission to, to, to provide some guide, guidelines for um, at least Montenegro and Serbia, which are already negotiating. Yes, th this methodology was intended for Albania and North Macedonia, but they are not, uh, uh, there are some political reasons for not applying it to uh, uh, Albania and North Macedonia, even though they are not ju justified. There is no reason, for example, for Montenegro not to implement it already, because Montenegro opened the last chapter during the last year, and that, that is some kind of reward, reward for, for it, because at least Montenegro made uh, some progress in all negotiating chapters. Yes, I agree that the, that uh, progress is at 
technical level, but still there is some progress in all initiating chapters in all areas a key in Montenegro. As I said, Montenegro has changed its government after 30 years, so at least there is political will now to cope uh, uh, a burden fight against corruption and organized crime, even though we have some uh, new problems arising from the new majority and uh, big political crisis in the country and uh, many other now um, um, some in, in the focus of the, of the public and in the focus of the, of the international community. I guess that the, the, this uh, new attitude and new perception within citizens that they can now change them and the last public pull from BFAC shows the sense of the Montenegrin citizens now believe that the government can be changed through elections. That's, some, that's something which is really important for the European integration process and for, uh, for the uh, democratization of the Western Balkans. And that with this all negative signals from the EU level, that such attitude can be uh, even diminished. So I guess that uh, the, 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 the most important part is how to move from this status quo. And in, in, that, uh, in that sense, uh, the, the new methodology implies that member states will have more active role in assessing situation on the ground in the, in the Western Balkans. And when uh, presented the annual reports in October, Commissioner uh, for Enlargement said that the member states provide the team for annual reports, but that's not what is needed for the Western Balkans. It is uh, what is needed is more close communication with stakeholders and active involvement on the ground. And that's what is missing, at least in the case of Montenegro, at the high level and also at the technical level or at the level of uh, this uh, really important part for reforms and for democratization. When I say um, at the high level, uh, President Macron meets regularly only with the Serbian President Vucic. There is ongoing campaign uh, within uh, pro-government uh, media in Serbia that, uh, example, Germany is bad, France is good, France is praising the, the, uh, what is uh, Serbia doing with the vaccines. And then this campaign is following with the negative campaign towards the EU. So it, it is paradox that the, that the French, uh, France is helping autocrats in Serbia to stay in power and it's not helping uh, a promotion of the EU in Serbia, but also in the Western Balkans. And I guess it's really, really important to have on daily basis this active involvement of, of French ambassadors in the Western Balkans with, with the government and with the civil society so just helping uh, uh, reforms on the ground. And then uh, also uh, France insisted to have this reversibility uh, principle in the new methodology. And this principle is uh, something which is priority, which is always uh, uh, something which is presented, uh, uh, presented in a way like the most important part of the methodology. I think that the, 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 this uh, punishment policy is not something which is, which is always encouraging for, for the Western Balkans. I think that the model of incentives and sanctions is really important for the Western Balkans, but I guess that there should be some plan how to involve uh, Western Balkans in EU policy if the countries are delivering. And actually, what are the clear sanctions if country is not delivering? But in order to be able to do so, uh, this methodology have, uh, has to be developed. That means that, for example, in the case of Montenegro, there should be uh, cl clear priorities on annual basis. And if uh, uh, Montenegro is fulfilling these criteria and the priorities, what is next? And what are these benefits which uh, Montenegro will get if it, it is fulfilling these criteria? So I guess the is also needed, not as a date of a session or year of, uh, of accession. Our government is now calculating and announcing that, uh, that Montenegro will be the next uh, EU member state, and that this date will be 2020. Uh, uh, 25 
and I guess that this, this is really optimistic and that this will not happen in four years because we have serious problems regarding the rule of law, but it's also the, the, the most important part of it that, uh, Western, that the EU does not know what to do with the Western Balkans, with Montenegro, but also with the rest, uh, rest of the region. So we always have uh, this game of bad and good up in the EU. If member states are not blocking the, the, the and the accession process and opening of negotiations, then the European Commission is delaying the, the uh, preparation of necessary instruments and, and everything. What we now have in Montenegro is that there is ongoing debate on, on some important systematic laws which are uh, connected with the rule of law reform. And we have some kind of um, uh, some kind of pressure from the EU not to go in that direction. And then the, again, the class balance is, is on the table. What will happen if Montenegro is not following recommendations from the EU level? And this is again the same uh, the same policy that uh, the country will be punished if it's not delivering, but will not be reward, reward, rewarded if it's if it is uh, delivering. So I guess kind of balance is needed uh, for us to use some kind of early warning mechanisms. And uh, I guess that non papers as, as the papers on on state of the rule of law uh, can be used as such kind of mechanisms. But as I said, the methodology has to be developed and implemented, and there are no objective reason to to uh, postpone this uh, its implementation uh, when it comes to to, to Montenegro. And uh, just um, sh briefly about the the, the uh, France uh, taking over presidency of, of the EU, I guess that it's really uh, it will be di really difficult to organize uh, uh, meetings as, uh, with uh, President Macron as as a host. And I guess that with this um, um, scheduled elections uh, during the next year, it will be difficult to uh, have uh, um, enlargement as a priority and also having in mind what uh, uh, Fra what is the uh, France position regarding the, the enlargement process. But I guess if uh, France uh, wants to be perceived as country which is helping democratization of the Western Balkans, there should be a clear agenda of cooperation with at least of cooperation with the Western Balkans. Uh, I guess that um, economic cooperation is, is also more than welcomed uh, uh, and also help on the ground uh, with the democratization. But at the moment, we are missing uh, this cooperation at bo both levels. So this is uh, for the beginning. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, we've heard everyone has noticed uh, that France has re-intensified its bilateral relations with Serbia. Uh, it doesn't seem that uh, other countries see that as a positive uh, point for the uh, EU enlargement, but can it at least help Serbia in that regard? Thanks, Marion, and thanks to a previous speaker for raising that up, because this is uh, the angle uh, from which I want to approach this, uh, this issue. I mean, from the standpoint of the Belgrade's pivot uh, towards uh, Paris. I mean, uh, we have seen in uh, now the last meeting was on February 1st to this year when uh, Serbian President Alexander Vucic was in Paris for talks with uh, his French counterpart, Monsieur Macron. And uh, this was the 11th meeting between the two heads of uh, state since Macron came uh, into office. And I think uh, what is behind this uh, increased uh, diplomatic exchange is the process in which uh, Serbia has uh, embraced France as its uh, main uh, great power backer in the West. Now, of course, uh, this bilateral relationship has a deep uh, historical foundation starting from the 19th century, but I won't go into this uh, deep history. I mean, many of the people uh, listening to this are probably aware of it uh, already. But uh, I want to say now, is this uh, Belgrade's uh, pivot towards uh, Paris uh, a reenactment of all historical ties? Well, not necessarily. I mean, we have seen that history did not play a significant part in November 2018 during the centenary of the World War I armistice when a Serbian delegation was insulted with a seating order at the delegation in Paris, forcing the French embassy in Belgrade to issue uh, an apology. And we, of course, we also remember some other unpleasant scenes, like, for example, April 2019, when several pro-government tabloids in uh, Serbia uh, branded the fire which caught uh, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral in Paris as uh, God's punishment for displaying uh, the fake state Kosovo's uh, flag. 
Now, these reports were, of course, la later retracted, uh, mo most probably due to the intervention from the Serbian government. But of course, the second and more practical question is, is this pivot uh, towards Paris about uh, Serbia's EU integrations? Particularly, as uh, Jovana just uh, mentioned, uh, President Vucic and the pro-government media and tabloids like to talk about uh, Macron as being a Serbian ally on its uh, road to the, to the European Union, uh, or to the European path. And indeed, after uh, Montenegro accepted the, the, the new methodology of the EU, Serbia also did it, but while Montenegro did it in a formal fashion, uh, Belgrade did it with, uh, in a much different, more political fashion, because Vucic accepted during the bilateral talks with uh, Macron in uh, Paris. So this was, I think, uh, a way for uh, Vucic to uh, court Macron by showing that uh, he is willing to embrace uh, French policy proposals. However, as we have all uh, concluded, the EU integrations is a very uh, rocky path. The EU is struggling with its own challenges. And of course, in 2020, Serbia did not open a single uh, chapter in its succession talks with the EU due over the declining uh, rule of law. And as uh, Loic and other speakers have mentioned, it is there is a certain degree of skepticism how enthusiastic Macron is about enlargement, particularly the painful experience that uh, North Macedonia and Albania experienced in 2019. So why is Belgrade embracing uh, Paris? That's uh, the second and most uh, logical question. I say that this is uh, the product of uh, Vucic's need to have a great power backer in the West particularly as some of his uh, old uh, foreign policy partnerships are in deep uh, crisis. Uh, for the past several years, uh, the main great power mentor of Mr. Vucic in the West was uh, Germany, led by uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, and we all know how enthusiastically he supported uh, her, her policy during the migration crisis, and uh, he was more than willing to use Angela Merkel as a tool uh, of domestic uh, legitimization. We remember Vucic visiting uh, Belgrade to see Angela Merkel only a couple of days before uh, Serbian presidential elections in 2017. Now, this uh, honeymoon between Merkel and Vucic uh, is over. I mean, M Angela Merkel was uh, very irritated over the fact that Vucic advocated uh, a land swap with uh, Hashim Takci as a resolution of the Kosovo dispute during Donald Trump's presidency in the US. And uh, after uh, last uh, summer's uh, violent protest in Belgrade over uh, COVID-19 uh, handling, uh, it became increasingly difficult for Germany to tolerate uh, illiberal tendencies uh, happening in uh, Serbia. And at the same time, the relationship with another great power backer in the West are also very shaky. After Vucic made a failed uh, bid on uh, Trump's uh, re-election, now he fears that uh, Germany and the US may, uh, might jointly pressure him in recognizing uh, Kosovo without any face-saving uh, settlement. So, in need uh, of a great power backer, and with Germany and the US out of the picture, who is left in the West? The UK, you can't go for the UK because it is not interested in the Balkans and it is co costing the post-Brexit ordeal. So that leaves uh, France. And the foundation for this was set uh, during the summer 2019. It was a very uh, powerful uh, bilateral score that Macron achieved back then when he gave uh, a speech in front of the Monument of Gratitude towards France in a well-rehearsed uh, French, impressing together Serbian citizens and uh, eliminating some of the past the diplomatic and political pleasantries. Now, we do see some bilateral uh, score, uh, bilateral points which are happening between Belgrade and Paris. I won't name them all, but for example, Serbia is purchasing Mistral's, an infrared man portable air defense system from France. And uh, of all the big uh, projects involving the French company, the most famous one is, of course, uh, there is a, a concession for modernizing and managing the Belgrade airport. But I think even more importantly, a contract for uh, constructing a Belgrade um, subway. So this is all part of uh, Belgrade investing uh, in its uh, ties with uh, France in need so that Vucic can uh, achieve, have a new diplomatic protector, a new great power mentor in the Western uh, ranks. And uh, of course, he is evidently calculating that there is a, a duopoly within the EU between, uh, for, uh, between Paris and Berlin. So he hopes that he might uh, use uh, Paris uh, sort of as a leverage, either to achieve better bargain on Kosovo or at least to ameliorate some of the potential pressures that can come from the likes uh, of Berlin. 
So this is a very strange situation where frequently the pro-government tabloids describe uh, Emmanuel Macron as the greatest Serbian ally for fight, uh, for, in the fight for Kosovo, even though the France was one of the first to recognize independent Kosovo, a very weird uh, formulation. I also think that this uh, pivot towards uh, Paris has, uh, has something to do also with the crisis in the foreign policy partnerships, but not just in the West, but also in the East. Now, despite the warm uh, facade, uh, Belgrade and Moscow do not trust each other. And we have seen this uh, during the last year when during uh, the signing of the Washington uh, Agreement on economic normalization between uh, Serbia and Kosovo in the White House. So, and so what is Vucic doing? His, uh, chi China has already replaced Russia as Serbia's leading Eastern partner, but now Vucic is pairing his primary Western partner, the Paris, with his primary Eastern partner, China. And we are seeing this from the joint, uh, from the joint uh, project uh, which will, of Belgrade Subway, which both the French and the Chinese companies will uh, participate. And the recently signed uh, EU-China investment deal in which President Emmanuel Macron played no small, small part, also played a part to inspire Vucic and his uh, entourage to make this uh, move. Now, how much will Belgrade profit from this remains to be seen. I have to be quite honest, I'm, I will probably end on a highly uh, pessimistic uh, note, uh, but uh, then again, I'm a British citizen, so pessimism is part of my intellectual DNA. So, I mean, on that front, I can say that I'm not expecting that uh, French foreign policy in the Balkans will produce any game changing effect, either when it comes to the resolution of the Kosovo dispute, nor when it comes uh, to the EU, because I'm not quite sure that uh, France is interested in having a hands-on 24 hours approach to the Balkans. I'm not quite sure that despite uh, any good intentions that either Macron or people who around him are that consider the Balkans a foreign policy priority that demands uh, are being constantly invested in. So, and, and at the same time, I won't even mention that we don't know whether Missy Macron will be re-elected in uh, 2022. So, the best thing I think that will be is if he's uh, doing some bilateral engagements with Belgrade or some other capitals, some bilateral uh, mutual benefits might be achieved. But from my standpoint, French foreign policy in the Balkans operate more from the bilateral standpoint at this moment in time. Mr. Macron is evidently more interested in establishing co collaboration with bi bilaterally with individual countries rather than being a, a champion for the European uh, Union in the Balkans. But uh, one thing is for sure, to paraphrase Henry Kissinger, when Vucic wants to talk with uh, Europe, he will be dialing uh, Paris, at least for now. And on that uh, pessimistic note, I will uh, end. Thank you. Uh, I know um, Sebastian Grico would like to react on uh, what you just said. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Vuk. I mean, I think you have a you have described everything, but I would like just to add one aspect from the French view about that. Again, we are talking about internal politics in France also. And as it was mentioned, I think by Alba uh, earlier, um, you know, Serbia is also the nest of many networks of disinformation, really, really connected to the far right of, uh, in Europe, but also in France. And you have also, of course, a, a historical uh, connection between France and Serbia, but which is already today just an issue for the far right and the conserv right conservative. Uh, so I believe, again, that Macron is uh, playing that game also with Serbia in order to, to contain, to maintain uh, his electorate, his conservative of the right wing, and also to step into the, the far right in a way to control, again, to prevent the far right and to prevent the, the, the right wing to, to slip into the far right, because we are in, in that, uh, in that uh, picture. So we have to, to keep in mind that there is also a lot of internal politics in the way Macron is dealing with, uh, with Serbia. And actually today, this morning, I was sent, someone sent me uh, some, uh, some big statement of the president of the French far right, uh, the, the president of the European Parliament of the group Identity and Democracy. And he made a big, uh, a big speech against enlargement, against Western Balkan, everything. So it's really, it's really something, an issue, enlargement and Western Balkan is really used and misused by the far right. And Macron knows that. So he's trying also to contain that by showing a kind of no neutrality at all, <laughs> a partiality with Serbia. There are obviously some industrial issues and contract, economic contract, 
But I think really that for him, politics matters. As I told you earlier at the beginning, uh, his thinking of his re-election since the fall 19, because this is the way the Republic works today in France with the five years mandate. So he's really on the second part of his mandate as president, he's just trying to, to gather as much as possible the right wing side for him on his, on his own side and to contain always the far right, building at the same time the struggle that he's the one, the only one against the far right and the far left as well. You know, just. Thank you. Um, is there any other way the, the other Western Balkan country could maybe team up together to try to uh, be more visible maybe to France as a way to maybe attract some of this attention? <laughs> I think that we are already grouped as the Western Balkan countries in joint efforts to show that, that this policy from the EU level and from the some member states level level is not justified and that, that it should be different. So I guess that civil society is um, united and civil society is advocating for different approach. Civil society is trying to explain that something is missing from the, from the EU's levels and especially from the level of the member states. But I guess that our uh, government uh, has to unite and has to, to, to show some more um, willingness to, to, to um, consolidate, to, to, to democratize the countries. And then in, in that sense, you know, but as Zoran said, even if we are fulfilling the criteria and commitments, uh, that's not the, the, the signal that the countries will progress. So I guess that the, there is need for joint efforts, but um, I, I guess that without a different signal from the EU, we, we cannot do much more. I think uh, just to chip in on the question what the countries can do uh, more, and it's good that Jovana talked now. I mean, in our study, um, uh, Montenegro amongst the Western Balkans countries uh, uh, scored best in terms of support of the French public opinion. And I think, you know, you squared that with a deeper research on the real on the correlation between knowing the region and and uh, supporting its EU integration. Well, I think you know there you have the answer. Uh, 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 an ad uh, to visit the country on a Paris bus has much more influence on the public opinion than whatever you know presidents of the countries themselves might say uh, uh, to the French opinion because they don't really care about Vucic nor, you know, Raman or whomever, you know, in, in that context. So, uh, so um, I think, you know, uh, much more, um, let's say, non-statal presence, normalizing the debate on the countries, getting to know the countries uh, in France, you know, public opinion, although, you know, you have to dig deeper on that simple yes or no question, but the public opinion on Montenegro, it's closer to the French, you know, more positive views of enlargement, you know, maybe, you know, 15 years ago than, uh, than uh, you know, when you look at other countries in the Western Balkans, simply because I think they're not known. So then people rely to, um, you know, uh, fake stereotypes uh, uh, propagated uh, through some of the French media about certain countries in the region. Uh, if the audience has questions, please uh, send them. We have time to take a couple. And how about um, maybe reaching out to someone else than President Macron in France? I mean, it, obviously he's the president, so he's uh, leading the current politics, but there, there is an election coming up. There will be other parties involved in the parliament, in the campaign during the election in the parliament later. Maybe this can also be uh, like sideways to, uh, to gather some attention. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe, yeah, Louis, we have Louis, please. If, you want. Well, if I may, I, I think you're being optimistic here. I uh, am trying, but this conversation is very, very pessimistic. I'm no, trying just to. Remind, uh, <laughs> um, uh, just, re just remember that the, uh, it was mentioned earlier during the campaign 2019 for European election on French TV. Uh, you asked the 10 candidates, what about Serbia and the EU? And eight of them either said no or said, or said uh, uh, we don't know. So basically, uh, there is no political force uh, on, the, on the French specter right now that is uh, either ready or willing or strong enough to endorse uh, anything related to, 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 enlarge, to enlargement, even though you would... Uh, open to, let's say, the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party right now is doing 5%. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense to do that. The only thing you can do uh, <laughs> is to try to, to reach uh, Macron's friend. I'm sorry, Sebastian, I know that it, it's painful for you, but still, that's the fact. Uh, reaching, uh, reaching President Macron's friend, why? Because basically you will have the, his force so center, center right, let's say, and the far right. There is no opening uh, other than that at the moment. No. Yeah, but I, just to add to Luik, and maybe that's what Seb Sebastian wants to say as well, because we wrote about it together as well. But I think, you know, politicizing this issue is a big mistake in France. You don't need to, you know, almost like not talking about it is better than, you know, but, but uh, when you talk about reaching to the political parties, but then, you know, there is the whole debate about renewing Europe, conference on the future of Europe. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there, including Western Balkans partners, civil society, you know, governments as equal partners in these debates is I think crucial and having them in France is also crucial. Uh, starting from there, starting more from bottom up than top down. It's very, you know, it's it's a big task. But if we want to be optimistic, you know, that that's where I would start. Yeah, and actually, I'm trying to be optimistic um, about the rate of, of the Socialist Party. We could talk a lot, but not about. I just want, I don't want to mention that. I mean that in a way, Macron has succeeded to trigger a kind of uh, of consciousness among some political parties because. I realized that only since two years within my own party and within the left, and even at the European Parliament, there is a sense of, yeah, something is happening and we should stop uh, relying just on, uh, on the European bureaucracy or on German position, what to think about Western Balkan. So Macron in a way has triggered a kind of, uh, of obligation for the political party to side, to side, to, to, to have a side, to have a stance about Western Balkan. So they have to look beyond or against what Macron has done on Western Balkans. This is why I think there is, it will be very useful before the national election to have much more um, exchange of civil societies from Western Balkans with different political parties in France. Just for them to realize that there is a mistake on, on the stance on France. And as you know, presidential election is about a lot of uh, regalia and things and the image of France abroad. We talk a lot about that. And if we can just have a kind of debate what is the image of France in Western Balkans, the next members of European Union? You know, you, you will find different position within the political parties. So in a way, politicization is a mistake, but now we have to politicize it in order for the political party just to get familiarized with the Western Balkan and just to realize this should not be a political issue. This should just be a respect of a normal process and Macron has made a mistake. So I, I see myself some windows just to, co to contradict Macron in a national debate about the, the enlargement. Thank you. But what is the perception in the region? Do you, is there any feeling that you can actually reach out somewhere else? Reach out for what? For support, for uh, maybe to try to improve in one, in some ways the image of the country, as we saw it can be very um, important. Or yeah, just to, to find support where you can find it. If the presidency is blocked, 
I mean, you can knock on the door forever, but maybe you can try to find another door, even if it's smaller or a window. Yeah, may I intervene? The, yeah. the, the, the thing is that if you, if we in the Balkans don't see, or the European Union as such, doesn't see the, you know, the Franco-German motor rolling, then it's difficult to push for any. And then it's, this is also internally for the EU and also vis-a-vis -vis enlargement. Internally is about, you know, uh, the consensus on strategic autonomy, for example. What does it mean? The Germans are calling uh, one way and the French are calling the other. The perceptions about how and why Europe needs to be strategically autonomous are different in Paris than in Berlin. And if there is no consensus beyond we want you in, regardless, you know, what does that mean in, in concrete, uh, in, 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 in concretely, then there is little to, to expect. Because obviously, you know, like, uh, obviously the, the whole process becomes uh, very, uh, very problematic. It's, you know, we have, we have left the vision about the enlargement process as a process of transformation of these countries becoming more European. Now it's about, about blockage and how uh, certain member states can gain a bit more from the candidate countries. This is how it is. Instead of being happier, uh, once you, you come closer to membership, is the other way around. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it, it reminds me of an onion. The more you peel it, the more you cry. It's not, it's not that you're more engaged, you're closer to uh, your better and better European. And you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Germany. We have a question. Uh, do any of you expect any efforts or push for progress on the Western Balkan from Germany in the next six months? And can this could this impact uh, France? And uh, in the longer term or medium term, if the US decides to have a renewed focus on the Balkan, how can this affect uh, France's position as well? Well, Germany is always trying to, to, to push the, the um, EU enlargement and uh, it wasn't successful during its presidency with the opening of negotiations with Albania, North Macedonia. We will see what will happen with the Berlin process, but I'm also expecting that Germany will be active and will, be, will support the, the enlargement. I don't see that this will influence the French position, but the, uh, it will be useful to have it. But you know, in some ways, uh, paradoxically, uh, if there, uh, if you look at, for example, Serbia and um, you know the time it took from the green light to the opening of the to to open the negotiations to the opening of the first chapters, apply that to North Macedonia in the last context. Not you know, uh, it would mean that probably somewhere in mid 2022 the first chapters could be opened. And I think if you now square that with the French presidential campaign and everything, you may paradoxically find yourself in a situation where actually it is the French presidency somewhere towards the end that, uh, that uh, you know, that sees this opening of the first chapter is, you know, not maybe, you know, because this is a high priority, but because it, they, the perception is that nobody cares, then it wouldn't hurt, you know, so, um, you know, I think if we want to see it faster, if Germany really wants to push, then it's now. Then it's during the Portuguese uh, presidency and uh, not later than that. I, I would be very skeptical, but you know. We have a question regarding uh, Turkey. Uh, maybe uh, Vuk can answer that. Uh, does the French relations with Turkey and their frozen EU accession path has an impact on enlargement policy for the Western Balkan? I think that there, Turkey uh, plays a part in the, con in the French uh, context and the enlargement in one uh, other specific way. I think it will probably, uh, I think it, as we are seeing that uh, French and Turkey are becoming uh, sort of rivals when it comes to Eastern Mediterranean issues. 
I think that this will negatively impact uh, the Western Balkans. And I think that, uh, for example, Belgrade uh, has took notice of this uh, process. I mean, when we saw the, when we saw tensions in Eastern Mediterranean in uh, late 2020, we even had uh, Vucic who even uh, put uh, Turkey on the same, in the same power rank as uh, Russia, US, uh, EU or China. I think this is uh, a misperception and uh, overstatement of, Russia, of Turkish power capabilities. But more important, he even said, we will not be shielded vis-a-vis Eastern Mediterranean uh, for uh, anyone. So we, in a sense, this is uh, an expression of the fact that the Balkans does not uh, want to be uh, impacted by the conflict, uh, by the growing strategic rivalries in Eastern Mediterranean. But I can say that if uh, the tensions do increase, I think it will only worsen the EU's, uh, the, uh, the, the Balkans' uh, European perspective. I mean, we have seen this in terms of uh, refugee crisis, where where many people have started to see the Balkans as a constant source of refugees and migrants as another source, potential exporter of instability, in this case, from the Middle East. So in a sense, I think that if uh, so, if some uh, if uh, things start to heat up in the Eastern Mediterranean between France and Turkey and uh, bilaterally between France and Turkey, I think it will only strengthen uh, the Eurosceptic uh, voices in uh, Paris and in other EU power centers. Thank you. Zoran, did I interrupt you earlier? No, no, it's fine. I just wanted to, to, to add, uh, maybe I will, you know, for someone that supported so much the process, uh, I have to be honest, you know, like um, there is a need within the union itself for a renewed political consensus on enlargement. And it's not about enlargement, it's about completion. We have increasingly used this term about completion and continental integrity. Uh, and I think that's a bit more precise than uh, than enlargement uh, than enlargement as um, uh, as such and why I'm saying because the process as it is envisaged now is not working it's more of a saga than a process that really transforms these countries and you know regardless of all the new methodologies regardless of making the process more technical and all the other improvements modifications of the process uh process uh meanwhile it is actually not producing the results and this is in major it's a major case of political will within within the european within the european union and i think it should be regarded like this because remember just when we were you know just a couple of years ago when we were talking about croatia being you know the country that has uh, negotiated the most, you know, very extensively, you know, for a long period of time. Does anyone remember how much Croatia negotiated with the European Union? That was around six years. It took from opening to closing of accession negotiations. And Jovane is here. Do you know how much Montenegro, as the, you know, the first of the PEC, negotiates already? More than nine years. And it's not even half, half of the uh, on the route. So this is like a yeah. You know, for me, I, I I have to say this is like a relationship. You know, like if if the two sides, if the two parties don't agree that they they will work things out in five or ten years, then it doesn't work. You need to change something, obviously. And this is if this is taking now ten years to get to half of the negotiations. With God knows how much time does you know more is needed for you know at least Montenegro to to finish that, then we have to you know then some things need to change, and you know we were very critical to the governments uh, in the Western Balkans all of these years, but I think now that the, the major problem relies it lies within the union, what the union wants and how the union sees this region. Because uh, in many of the cases, when the, where the union has particular interest, this region is very integrated already. You know, take take for example security or defense. You know, if you if we talk about Frontex, then there is a huge push by the member states to sign the, the status agreement. 
if we talk about Europol, these countries are very aligned and, you know, almost like a member state, all, you know, on the same level as Switzerland, which is part of the Schengen area, or now the invitation to be included in PESCO. So you see, there are a lot of policy areas where these countries are very integrated, almost as a member state. But if there is an interest of the union itself, where there is no interest, we are hardly pushing. You know, the, it, it's really problematic. You know, it's very now because of the loss of credibility, lack of credibility of EU in the region, it's extremely difficult to push the political elites to implement or reach very difficult political decisions under the banner of the European Union. Until now, that was very possible. You know, whatever, when it comes to a certain reform, however difficult it is, when you say it's kind of an EU requirement, then it's easily pushed through the political elites. Now, that is not, that, that is not the case. And the first question that they're asking, what is there for us? It's not about how much do we need to reform and, you know, to transform our societies in order to progress more in the process is okay, I will do this, what I will get for, from there. And, you know, comp you know, clear transactional approach. No, we are not even talking about transformation. It's transaction. You will give me something, you will, I will give you something in return. And if this is the process that we all don't want to, that we want a genuine transformation, that something needs to change. If the relationship cannot work its differences in 10 years, you are ne not meant to be together. Find um, another way. Change thanks. some. Thanks. I'll stop. Uh, because we're over time, maybe Alba, I can give you the last word very quickly. Yes, I just want to add on this concept of uh, that Zoran said of completion, continental completion. It's it's and it connects also to the person who asked about the uh, nexus between U.S. and the re-engagement of the U.S. And uh, we have heard President Macron that he is very keen on the concept of strategic autonomy. And all this focus on the geopolitical understanding and there cannot be strategic autonomy without this completion is as easy to understand as that. So I think that uh, when we, and it is in the heart of this, uh, of this dichotomy. So however you see the union being more enhanced uh, more together, uh, more federalist union, it cannot be done before this completion is, com is, is, is already engulfs the entire region. Thank you. Uh, I think we will stop now uh, since uh, this conference was lasting until one. Thank you so much, uh, all of you for uh, participating. Thank you for the panelists from the first panel for staying in uh, and uh, giving your comments in the second panel. Um, that's it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.